Good afternoon. That was magnificent. Thank you. That moving performance came from the Oberlin Gospel Choir, directed by Associate Professor of Jazz Voice Latanya Hall. A recording of the choir forms part of the installation of Dawood Bey's photograph from his Night Coming Tenderly Black series that is the inspiration for our time together today. I'm Andrea Durstein, the director of the Allen Memorial Art Museum, and along with our staff who have contributed to the realization of this program, I'm very happy to welcome you. We are thrilled to welcome acclaimed photographer Dawood Bay and Oberlin College Associate Professor of Creative Writing, Shonda Feldman, in conversation. The Allen's curators, Sam Adams and Hannah Kinney, together organized the installation Picturing the Intangible, Oberlin Looks at Dawood Bay's Night Coming Tenderly Black, importantly including community members in the process and allowing viewers to see and to listen to what Bay's photograph is saying through other voices. Now I'd like to ask Hannah and Sam to introduce both the exhibition and our speakers. What a wonderful honor, not only to spend the evening with Shonda and Dawood Bay, but all of you here tonight. This is a really wonderful evening. 
Um, so for the past three years, the space where Dogwood Bay's photograph is now installed has been an important one for the Allen to experiment with new approaches for making our collections resonant. This current installation began with Sam and I wanting to think about how we could minimize our own interpreted voices to instead make space for other forms of knowledge from the Oberlin community to allow us to open up an experience of looking at and feeling through a work of art. As we searched through storage, we kept returning to Dawood's photograph, Night Coming Tenderly Black, untitled number 24 at Lake Erie from a series tracing the Underground Railroad in Northeast Ohio. It was not just that very local history that drew us to it, but also the time and patience the photograph requires for your eyes to adjust to its darkness. It is an artwork that continues to give the longer you sit with it. By sitting and looking with members of the community whose voices are reflected in the installation, the history that the photograph poetically alludes to came forth for us in a multiplicity of ways. As we sat with Maggie Robinson, listening to her tell us with such pride and admiration, the story of her great-great-grandfather William Fleming Robinson's journey to freedom, the Underground Railroad transformed from the mythic generalized history of textbooks to the human story alive and carried in Maggie's words. Liz Schultz, the director of the Oberlin Heritage Center provided us with multiple freedom seekers accounts of looking out at Lake Erie, offering perspectives on the simultaneous hope and uncertainty the water held, not just as a symbol, but as an actual place that was encountered by individuals ready to cross those last 50 miles to freedom. We went to Shonda Feldman, looking for guidance on how to read Langston Hughes' Dream Variations, the poem of 1924 quoted in the title of Dawood's work. She skillfully attuned us to the language and the rhythm of the lines that captured the soft, tender embrace and safety of darkness. In that conversation, Shonda also revealed how much she had thought about this series of photographs as well as how she'd thought about the relationship between place and history, the mythic and the humanizing that are central to this photographic series, as well as her own poems. We therefore are really delighted to bring these two artists together in conversation about how history can be transformed and ultimately deeply and personally felt through artistic acts of imagination. I'll now introduce our speakers. Shonda Feldman is Associate Professor and Chair of Creative Writing at Oberlin College. Her poems appear in journals and anthologies, including Poetry, The Southern Review, The Best American Poetry, and The Ringing Ear, Black Poets Lean South. Feldman's honors include a National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellowship, the Wallace Stegner Fellowship at Stanford University, and an Ohio Arts Council Excellence Award. In Feldman's first poetry collection, Approaching the Fields, 2018, she was praised for her stumble-proof voice, heartfelt precision, and a cadence reminiscent of old gospel rhythms rising from deeper reflections on the evolution of self and culture. Her poetry collection, Glance, is forthcoming from LSU Press in 2024. Thank you, Shonda also for letting us include your poem, Glance, as part of the display on the other side of this wall. Your insights into Langston Hughes and the poetics of Bay's work are deep and profound. Thank you for all you've given us. Dawood Bay is one of the foremost photographers working today, and his work has become a cornerstone in contemporary photography. His career began in 1975 with a series of photographs, Harlem, USA, that were exhibited to critical acclaim in his first solo exhibition at the Studio Museum in Harlem in 1979. His work has since been the subject of exhibitions at museums and galleries worldwide, including the Art Institute of Chicago, the National Gallery of Art, and the Walker Art Center. 
His 2020 exhibition, Dawood Bay, an American project, appeared at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the High Museum of Art, and the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. The 2022 exhibition, Dawood Bay and Carrie Mae Weems, in dialogue, traveled to the Grand Rapids Museum of Art, the Seattle Art Museum, Tampa Museum of Art, and the Getty Center. Bringing together Bay's work on the harrowing journeys and human realities of the Virg Virginia Slave Trail Louisiana plantations and Ohio's Underground Railroad, his exhibition, Elegy, opened last month at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Congratulations on that major achievement. Bay is currently professor of photography at Columbia College, Chicago, where he has taught since 1998, and is a recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship, the United States Artist Art Award, the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship, a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, and a Lifetime Achievement Award from Howard University, among many other honors. Please join me in welcoming Shonda and Dawood to the Allen. <laughs> I want to start by thanking the Allen Art Museum for hosting this event, and I especially want to thank the curators, Hannah Kinney and Sam Adams. Uh, I also want to thank all of you for being here. I see community members, artists, students, faculty, and staff, and it's lovely to share this evening with you. And I also want to thank Dawood Bay for joining us. Uh, it is such a pleasure and honor to have the opportunity to speak with you. And thank you to the Oberlin Gospel Choir for that amazing, moving performance. Well, thank you, thank you. And um, I also want to uh, thank the museum both for the acquisition of the work that precipitated this program and for shaping uh, this wonderful program and conversation with uh, Tonda Feldman uh, around uh, that acquisition. And any any time when people leave their homes, uh, especially in the winter time, to come out and hear people conversate about art and photography. That's a good night to me. Mm -hmm. So thank all of you for being here. And I also was deeply moved by the program being introduced by the Gospel Choir and that particular song, uh, especially uh, Wade in the Waters, which is part of the sonic landscape of fugitivity. It's part of the, the coded sonic landscape of the plantation and uh, the relationship between that song and this photograph and the whole uh, Night Coming Tenderly Black project is a uh, is a profound one. Uh, I don't want to speak about it at length, but that song, when it was heard, weighed in the water. And obviously, water is important, is an important piece of my project. But in the context of the antebellum plantation landscape, when enslaved African Americans heard that song or sung that song, they meant that they were going to plan an escape from slavery that evening, wade in the water, get ready, be ready. You know, we're gonna trouble the water. So it was wonderful to begin the program with that uh, song, which is so much a part of uh, the sonic landscape and the conceptual frame for this particular project. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to continue talking about that. Uh, we had the opportunity to talk earlier in the day and had a lovely conversation. And towards the end of that conversation, you uh, mentioned Black expressive culture. And you also have a quote that will circle through on this screen about uh, the landscapes of history are also Black spaces. And to me, this uh, shows your artistic concerns with landscape 
moving beyond documentation, moving beyond physical representation. And I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about Black expressive culture, Black space, as they relate to your concerns for your work. All right. I'll, I'll try to do that without okay. taking up the whole evening. Okay. <laughs> I know. Uh, this particular project, uh, I have to say, uh, first, uh, came into being uh, at the invitation of the Front Triennial uh, here in, in Cleveland. Uh, so we're very close to uh, the place and places that uh, this work was made in. Uh, I also would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge sitting in the front row, Fred Bidwell, uh, the creator of the Front tri Triennial, uh, who is the one who initially invited me to consider the possibility of making some uh, work here. So I, I thank you before, Fred, but thank you uh, again. Uh, the work that I do is very much a part, I consider it to be, of the long history of Black expressive culture. This particular work, it has two uh, conceptual points of departure, uh, one of which is Langston Hughes' poem, Dream Variations. The last couplet of that poem is Night Coming Tenderly, Black like me, not coming tenderly, black like me. So this attaching of blackness and the darkness of blackness, which could be seen as foreboding, was in fact read by Langston Hughes as a kind of tender embrace. So that's where the title of the work comes from. It comes from that. And then also, when I started thinking about night coming tenderly, uh, this idea of blackness, the black subject, the black narrative, and the materiality of blackness. For those who know Roy D. Carabas photographs, I, I kind of just described Roy D. Carabas photograph. Right. This idea of the black subject, wrapping this kind of blackness of black space around them and then making these materially rich and beautiful very dark prints. So this work for me, Roy Dickerbarber has been uh, a kind of formative influence of mine, mm -hmm. going back to uh, my initial interest in photography when I saw the book Sweet Fly Paper of Life. Mm -hmm. But then even more so when I first encountered the actual prints, these beautifully printed, dark, black pictures of black people. Yes. So this wrapping that narrative and the materiality of blackness around this notion of uh, the black subject, the black body, black space, that plus Langston Hughes' uh, poem gave me the conceptual kind of North Star yes. by which to begin thinking about and making this work. Mm -hmm. And what I really admire about this work and about Night Coming Tenderly Black is that that Blackness, those Black tones invite me or anyone as a viewer to come closer, to really look and when my experience, when I come closer to look, is that I've stepped into the photograph. Yeah, yeah. And that's, uh, that's also uh, largely and partially a function of scale. To make an object of such a scale that when a viewer stands in front of it, their field of vision is limited to the photograph. It kind of, you know, blacks out mm -hmm. the rest of the world around the picture. And also uh, that use of uh, material blackness, you know, kind of invites 
the viewer to a closer engagement with the work. Some of you may or may not know the background of the making of this work materially, uh, but the work, as, as you uh, described it, uh, the work is the visualization of an idea. The work is not a statement or a restatement of fact. Uh, no more than de Carava made his photographs in that kind of dark black space, which in fact would have you tripping over something. You know, he was making those prints to realize a particular idea. These photographs, which were not made at the time of day that they appear to be made, were also printed to realize this idea of fugitivity under cover of darkness. Mm -hmm. And the viewer has the opportunity to step into that history and that landscape and imagine themselves as yeah. fugitive. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, to, to, go, to go a step further, part of what's going on in these photographs by not making them uh, at nighttime, some of you, if you are photographers or you understand how photographic materials work, it would be impossible to get the level of material description of the landscape in a photograph, photographing at nighttime. Right. So one of the reasons that I made the photograph, you know, at different times of the day was to get all of that material information you know, what the landscape looks like, what it feels like, and then to take that information and to bring it down to approximate a different time of day, but to also, within that blackness, still have a lot of information. Because I wanted to suggest what that landscape might have looked like and felt like for those African-Americans uh, formerly enslaved African-Americans seeking their own self-liberation, what that landscape might have looked like and what it also might have materially felt like, which is also why the photographs are made from an eye-level vantage point, mm -hmm. from a very human vantage point, because I wanted to make these photographs as if through the eyes of that, that's really what the positionality in the photographs are about, to make this work kind of from the vantage point of those imagined African-Americans moving through that particular landscape in a way that was so materially rich it would draw you in and you would be able to not only block out the world around you, but to have all of this information begin to emerge from the photograph if one took the time to really look deeply into them. Mm -hmm. And I would be remiss as a poet if I didn't go back to Langston Hughes for just a moment. Uh, and the the, class, the couplet that uh, starts this collection, that titles this collection, um, Night Coming Tenderly, Black Like Me, um, creates this cosmology. This is another layer of blackness Absolutely. on this work, right? Because there's a conversation there as well with black expressive culture and culture making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for me, the work that I do is directly in conversation with other black expressive forms. And I want the titling of the work to allude to that. You know, the project that came after this, the photograph that I made, on and around the landscape of various plantations in Louisiana. The title of that project is In This Here Place, which is a line from Toni Morrison's Beloved, and which she talks about from that same kind of antebellum period, the experience of being in this here place. You know, that's a really profound passage if you know Beloved or if you read it. And so, as a way of signaling to the viewer, and both signaling my own uh, variously uh, inspired sense of making the work, 
uh, try to allude to those who are also engaged in this Black expressive culture. The most recent project is called Stony the Road from what became known ultimately as the Black National Anthem. Stony the Road, we tried bitter to chastening rod. You know, this is the road, this is the slave trail. This is that trail leading to the bitter chastening rod. Right. So again, linking the work up to other forms of uh, Black expressive culture and history is really uh, central to how I think about the work. Mm -hmm. And something that is apparent about uh, these landscape projects is that we don't see people in them. However, previous projects, you are taking portraits of people. So that's a shift. Yeah, this, the um, Night Coming Tenderly Black was a huge shift for me, a huge conceptual shift uh, for me in my practice. Uh, it wasn't easy work to make by any means. Um, because for the larger part of my career and practice, I've been making photographs about the human subject, the Black subject, Black body, Black persona, Black interiority. Uh, and when people say to me that with Night Coming Tenderly Black, the, the, the people have disappeared from the pictures, my, my response is not really. Mm -hmm. They've just gone from being here to being here. Mm -hmm. You know, they're now the eyes through which the work is made. So they're still, for me, uh, very present in that sense. But, you know, the broader question of uh, the landscape for me, you know, which is why some of these uh, photographs in the beginning uh, of this uh, slide presentation. You know, those 19th century landscape photographs from the American West are pretty much formative to the way uh, the landscape came to be sort of and envisioned and visualized and within the history of photography. Uh, and the work that I make is very much in conversation with that history. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of intervention into that history. It's also a way of uh, acknowledging some of the gaps in that history, some of the problematics within that history, but it's still my history, right. you know? And the work of Lee Freelander, especially mm -hmm. his monument project, and with Freelander, made these photographs all across the country of monuments, places of history that still exist as part of the contemporary landscape. Uh, and that work was very important to me as well. Even as I was making portrait-based work, mm -hmm. you know, I have uh, a wellspring of knowledge about the history of this particular medium and art form. And Joel Sternfeld's work mm -hmm. on this site, uh, which are landscapes of places where trauma, where traumatic acts occurred, occurred in the past. They're not visible in the photograph, but they're very much embedded in the landscape of place in which he made those photographs. I, I feel my work is very much in conversation with all of that speaking from a place of Blackness, speaking from a place of inscribing the Black presence into that history. But the work that I do is very much a part of that history, mm -hmm. which is why I begin with those first group of pictures, you know, to make that point that this is about landscape tradition and about, in my case anyway, expanding the possibilities of how that uh, tradition can be made to function. You know, because one, one final thing about the Western landscape photographs, mm -hmm. you know, those photographs both uh, inscribed a certain language uh, that almost all photographers, especially who make photographs in those kinds of environments, are uh, indebted to. But those photographs were also the visual manifestation of this notion of manifest destiny. 
Yes. The survey photograph. Yes. They were made to inscribe a certain false history, a pervasively false history about what the American landscape was, mm -hmm. the supposedly uninhabited American landscape that puts into place this notion of manifest destiny. Right. I looked, uh, I was looking at one, uh, there's an image from the uh, Columbia Cascades in Oregon, and I believe it was taken in the 1870s. And the, the gallery label at the Met says that it is a picture of virgin terrain. And uh, I was quite surprised. Well, not surprised actually at all in some ways, I have to say. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I thought that that is significant. That is an erasure. Um, and I see some of your work acting in resistance to that kind of erasure uh, in relationship to Black history. And I'm wondering if we can talk about your photographs in Louisiana. Um, and when I look at those photographs, I know some of them were taken at Evergreen, which is an exact location, a plantation. And I'm thinking about uh, what those photographs, that project can say to us that deep history in our contemporary moment? Well, the, the Louisiana photographs uh, in this here place, they were made uh, on uh, the landscape of five different plantations in Louisiana, uh, up and down what's called uh, River Road, which at one time, uh, there were upwards of 350 plantations. On, on River Road. Uh, that worked for me. The most intact plantation still of all of them where I ended up making most of the work was the Evergreen Plantation. Uh, Evergreen is the largest intact plantation landscape in the country. All of the original buildings from the moment that plantation was constructed by the enslaved people who then inhabited and worked that plantation are all still very much uh, in place. So for me, Evergreen is uh, it's a sacred site. And I consider all of these places where I've made my work uh, to be kind of sacred sites of a kind. Uh, but the the idea of what those plantations were and wanting to create uh, an immediate experience of the places. Again, I level vantage point as they might have been encountered at the moment that they were active plantations where enslaved African-Americans were working. One thing I should say about all of these projects is the, uh, to decision to make this work in black and white as opposed to color. If they were large scale and color, they would have a conspicuously contemporary object quality about them. Uh, black and white is the, is the material of photographic history. And so by making them in black and white, that's the first step towards creating a kind of disconnect for the viewer between the past and present. The present looks like this, red pants, you know, paper coat. I mean, the, the world is in color, but thinking about the past and rendering that past materially in black and white is another way of getting to this idea of creating a kind of liminal place in the work, which is what all of this work is about, creating a liminal space that is somewhere between past and present. You know it's the present because I made them, and yet for the most part, there's no evidence in the photographs of the contemporary moment, mm -hmm. which is what creates, and I, I've seen people kind of really stumble into the photograph and kind of come out when they encounter me, oh, you're the one that made these, right? Mm -hmm. Like I encountered two women at the Art Institute. I was mm -hmm. walking through with the curator and they were interested from the photograph 
And then me and the curator walked in and they, they recognized me. Mm -hmm. And they were startled. Mm -hmm. And they said, but, but you made these photographs, right? And I kind of I, I kind of knew immediately what was happen, happening. They had gone so far into the photograph, my appearance kind of pulled them back into the contemporary moment. I don't often have the experience of seeing people experience mm. the work, but I do know that one of the things that I hope happens is that they momentarily shut out the world around them and deeply inhabit these spaces of history. What I also hear you saying, though, is that the past is in the present. It is. It doesn't go away. That history always. Is, is always with us um, always. And, and will be in the future. Yeah, and I think the photographs are kind of uh, an object insistence on that. Yes. That uh, even as I'm making the work, I'm making the work very intentionally to put myself in the place of the past. I'm not photographing the space that I'm in, which is full of color, which is full of light. That, that, that's not the work that I'm making. So when I'm there, I'm imagining and making the work, not trying to document where I am, which in fact looks very different from the photograph. And in that particular uh, series in the Louisiana, photographs there, well, in all of the series, but in that one, I'm I'm drawn to, there's the, the trauma of the plantation system that is evident. Um, but I also see a place for love in those photographs. Uh, absolutely. You know, and I tell people the plantation experience for African Americans was definitely horrific but I don't make work to re-inscribe horror because even as the plantation experience was horrific, there were Black culinary traditions that came out of the plantation. There were Black literary traditions. There were Black sonic traditions, musical traditions. There was a wealth of Black culture that still transcended even as it sprang up in the midst of the plantation system, you know. So, you know, especially with Night Coming Tenderly Black, which really points most explicitly within that history to this idea of self-liberation, fugitivity, moving towards freedom by way of Lake Erie. So, yeah, the work is not, for me, uh, about reinscribing a certain notion of horror, even as that history is horrific. You know, the fact that, you know, we are having this conversation in this place, right. you know, suggests all of the things that have somehow, some glorious way, somehow, sprang up and grew out of that horrific history. So I, I never want the work to be seen as a kind of one dimensional representation or reminder of uh, the horrors of not just African American history, but American history, quite frankly. You know, the work is, for me, I'm making it dimensionally. It doesn't deny any of that history, but when one thinks about the uh, plantation, in particular, there is a wealth of Black cultural utterance that was birthed and continued on uh, out of that experience. And that's very much a part of the work as well. Can you say more about that? Are you alluding to the, the film installation and collaborating on these projects with other artists? Yeah, uh, with the Louisiana work, uh, I also, and with the most recent project, uh, I've made uh, film works as well. And with the uh, Evergreen uh, project, Night Coming Tenderly Black, I also made uh, a film that goes along with uh, the In This Here Place work 
Uh, it's called Evergreen, and it was uh, shot on the Evergreen Plantation. And in addition to the cinematic piece of it, there's also a sonic uh, soundtrack that uh, I collaborated with uh, a vocalist and musicologist, mm -hmm. uh, Imani Uzuri, whose area of both research and performance uh, are those African-American songs of the antebellum era. And having her create the soundtrack was a way of bringing forth all of those other sonic, vocal, musical possibilities that the plantation, uh, the plantation reality gave rise to. You know, so I, I, I've continued making films because, you know, films have the capacity for the stretching and the expanding of ideas in a way that the fundamentally mute photograph doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Photographs are inherently mute. I, I think we all get that. They don't, they don't make sounds. They don't do anything. They might provoke things in the imagination. But as objects, they're inherently mute. So I've been making films as a way to bring a contextual and historical sonic uh, dimension to that work, which is made in the same places in which the photographs have been made, mm -hmm. to amplify another piece of the history sonically, to activate another piece of the history sonically. And that's immersive too, it, it hits all the senses. And I'm wondering for you in preparing to make photographs or to collaborate, uh, what do you do? What is the research that goes into making these photographic projects? Well, the work is very research-based. Uh, I probably spend more time doing research than I spend actually making the work. <laughs> to be honest with you, mm -hmm. um, because I need to be as deeply steeped in the history of the places in which I make my work uh, so that the work is really grounded in that history. Uh, the work that precipitated the landscape-based work, uh, the Birmingham Project, uh, I spent close to 10 years in Birmingham before I figured out how I wanted to make that work. By then, I, I, I had, I had, and I had encyclopedic knowledge <laughs> about the history yeah. of that place from all of that research. But that gives me a firm grounding. It allows me to feel that I can go in and make the work with a deep knowledge base, yeah. and to make the work with a very real integrity that I didn't just show up yesterday, walk the place, make some photographs. I, I, I spend a lot of time uh, in the research phase of the place. And then also, of course, time spent in the places trying to figure out the fundamental question of how one gives some kind of resonant and coherent form mm to this history. Mm -hmm. You know, the history yeah. is one thing, the objects that we make, in this case, the four-sided, two-dimensional, black and white, flat object. Now, I have to take all of that and figure out within the language of that kind of object making, how to make something that resonates. And once I'm there making the work, that's actually all I think about, hmm. the making piece of it. Okay. Uh, you know, the history is already there. It's a given. It's, uh, it's why I'm there. The only place in which that was a little less true was at Evergreen Plantation, hmm. because it's an undisturbed plantation landscape. And you're going to feel something, whether you want to feel something or not. And the person who uh, uh, manages and is the director uh, of that historic site, they encourage a real reverence for the site. Visitors are not allowed to run in that space. Don't bring your kids in here. 
playing ball or thinking they're in the park. No, this is not that kind of space. So, you know, but as far as your question goes, you know, the work is very deeply rooted in research. Uh, that research doesn't necessarily any more than the emotions. It doesn't tell me how to make something, but it gives the making very real grounding. It allows me to feel that I can be here and make something about this place because I've done enough research to know where I am. So there's that. There's the emotional piece of it. You know, the emotional piece I don't think about while I'm there because emotions don't tell you how to make something either. Hmm. There's a reason for showing up. Yes. But once you're there, it doesn't tell you how to make something. You know, so there's all of these pieces of the process of making all of this work. But once I'm there, I'm making work. I'm not trying to translate emotion into pictures. Hmm. I don't even know that that's really possible in the kind of work that I do, but I do want the viewer to have an emotional response. And that may sound contradictory, but it's also contextual, understanding where the work is made. And that is definitely a part of the meaning that the viewer brings to the experience of uh, looking at the work. And in your most recent project, the photographs that are taken on the Richmond slave trail. We talked a little bit about this earlier, but, uh, and I, I, we didn't get a chance for me to, to form the question for you to answer. Um, but I'm wondering when I look at those photographs, um, there's a different relationship for me as the viewer with landscape and with nature. In Night Coming Tenderly Black, I feel the landscape's embrace. I feel the possibility of moving towards freedom. Um, but in the Richmond Slave Trail photographs, there's a, fore a foreboding presence and movement. Um, I feel as if I'm about to get lost in a maze yeah. and all that history rushes on to me in the viewing experience. Yeah, I, I want those photographs made on the uh, slave trail to uh, allude to the disorienting experience of an unknown place. You know, the slave trail runs right alongside the James River and the enslaved are brought into Virginia by way of the James River. Virginia, was the epic center of the trade in enslaved black bodies. And the James River was uh, the commercial highway, so to speak, for that trade. But I wanted to, in both the photographs and in the film work, the two channel film that I made uh, on the slave trail, even more so because I have the sonic piece to work with, but to emphasize this experience of an unknown landscape that you're being marshaled through and you don't know where you're going. You don't know what's around this bend. You, you only know that you have been snatched from home. You're, you have to imagine thousands of miles from home and now you're shackled and being walked through this space that is a little bit wider than the eye here. And upwards of 350,000 enslaved Africans were walked from the docks to what's now called Shaco Bottom along that trail where they were then, or the auction houses and slave auction uh, houses and slave uh, blocks were in Shaco Bottom. But yeah, that work, I wanted it to have that feeling of disorienting foreboding, yeah. which again is really a making problem because if I don't show you what's around the curve, if I stand here, you can see what's around there. If I stand here, you can't. So where do I choose to stand? Yes. Yeah, and this is what I'm thinking as I'm making the work. What's the narrative and how to make 
the construction of the pictures support and amplify that narrative through a series of uh, formal and positional uh, decisions. But I wanted that work to have that kind of disorientation because it's already inherently narrow, it's confined. And if you think about upwards of 350,000 endless over years, black bodies being walked, ch chained, shackled in this space, I wanted through the decisions about the placement of the camera and positionality and being able to look deeply enough into the landscape to discern what I call the structural geometry of the space. Because it's pretty narrow and it's three miles long. And you can stand there and think everything looks the same. There's nothing going on here. So the challenge for me in making that work is how to keep restructuring these pictures in order to restructure a different experience of place, a different disorienting experience of place in which, you know, you talk about wade in the water, water is central, like you see here. You know, there's water, water, there's the James River. This notion of the water is kind of central to the project, you know, with the plantation pictures, the Mississippi River was right across the road. So I have a picture of the Mississippi River because all of the product of enslaved labor was being moved into market by way of the Mississippi River. You know, so I, I know I've gotten a little away from your question. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. And uh, oh, so, so pardon me. No, that's all right. <laughs> I, I'm I'm glad we went there. And it's amazing to um, to believe and say that we are. We're we at, at that point, point. and I, I still have so many questions. Okay, maybe, maybe one come. more conversation, <laughs> one more extent. Well, I, I will ask a wrapping up question, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking again about the titles to your work and these gestures uh, towards uh, other Black artists and makers. And can you say something just about your own formative uh, experience with arts or your lineage as an artist? Well, that's another conversation, okay. I think. <laughs> yeah, because, well, for example, when I talk about being able to see the structural geometry of the space, I'm acutely aware that my language is not the language of photography. Yes. Most photographers I know don't talk like that. Uh, the conversation around photography uh, has been largely content driven, what it's of. But I came up in the studios of Ed Clark, mm -hmm. William T. William, mm -hmm. uh, Howard Dina Pindell. Uh, Mel Edwards, all of these painters. So I guess I have absorbed from them this language of articulating, especially if you leave out Mel, which is different, but they were all painters, but they are working on the flat two-dimensional surface. And the way they talked about drawing narrative and content out of the form of the work, mm -hmm. which ironically, they're all what we would call abstract painters. That's who I came up with, you know. Uh, so underneath all of my other intentions, I guess I'm a formalist. Mm -hmm. And someone told me that one time, oh, you're a formalist. And I said, well, I always thought the form is what drives the content. So if you want to call me a formalist, I don't think it's a bad word. But, you know, my, other than Roy DeCarava and a handful of uh, Black photographers, mostly the members of a group that was known as the Kamonge Photographer, the yeah. Kamonge Photography Collective, uh, I came to know most of them very well. Uh, they were my mentors and then my friends. But uh, the bulk of my associations as an artist 
coming up uh, was largely hanging out in the studios of painters, mm -hmm. uh, poets. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a musician. I started out in music, playing jazz, which is another abstract form. It's all about form and how, how do you manipulate form and sound. There are no words, so there's nothing to tell you what you're supposed to feel, you know, which I think has a very real relationship to uh, abstract painting. So, yeah, my lineage, I, you know, Romeo Bearden was very important to me. Uh, there's a book that uh, Romeo Bearden wrote with a friend of his, Carl Holty, uh, that was, uh, it's called The Painter's Mind, and with Bearden breaks down how he makes his work structurally, uh, looking at the Hoot Vermeer and all of those Dutch painters, you know, any interior photograph that I've made with a human subject in it is directly beholden to Romeo Bearden mm -hmm. and then indirectly to De Hooch and Vermeer and all of those other Dutch painters who made those great interior portraits. Uh, so all, all of this is part of my history, but most immediately uh, in terms of my influence, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, a painter that I was married to a painter for several years, of course, a non-representational painter. In another life, I've written a lot about non-representational artists. <laughs> Most people probably don't know because they haven't gone looking for that. Mm. But I've uh, written about a lot of that work because I have very first-hand knowledge of that work. I, I grew up with those artists. So it's not second-hand art historical knowledge. I had deep conversations with them about it. And I'm uh, absolutely capable of uh, writing about it, uh, which I have done when uh, people who know I write ask me to write. Mm -hmm. I just wrote an essay of Deborah Roberts' new book. I don't know if you know Deborah Roberts, yeah. painter. I just contributed an essay to a Deborah Roberts' uh, book. So I don't know, a lot of my friends and the people that I came up with who, because they were mostly 10 years older than I was, they were the generation ahead of me. So a lot of them have started disappearing. Mm. Uh, of my contemporaries, the one that I'm closest to and that I, we kind of came up together, you know, it would be me and Carrie Mae Reams. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, Carrie Mae and I have had the longest ongoing conversation for well over four decades now. That's wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this evening and for this conversation. I know we could go on all night, but we we will have to. We'll have to. Well, thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank all of you again for coming out. Thank you very much. <laughs>